Passion Harvest. <laughs> Hello, passionate listener, li- listeners and watchers. Welcome to Passion Harvest. Thank you so much for joining us, where, whatever date or wherever you are in the world. I'm Louisa, your host, International Passion Ambassador. I'm so excited. Another incredible guest on the show today. His name is Dr. David Furlong. David is a recognized authority on possessions, attachments, or soul fragments and spirit release. David has developed a methodology that combines intuitive healing techniques coupled with regression to help remove intrusive entities and spirit attachments. David grew up in a family that practiced spiritual healing, which has become his lifelong interest. This developed in his late teenage years into exploring different spiritual traditions and his interest in the esoteric led him into contact with a small group of like-minded individuals that received guidance from a channeled source in 1981. David established the College of Healing in the UK. In 2002, he was invited to develop the training programs of the Spirit Release Foundation. Since that time, David has been refining and developing the methods that help clients release deep-seated trauma and entity attachment. In 2011, David established a new organization called the Spirit Release Forum, which now runs training programs under his directorship. David is the author of seven books, they're amazing, and continues to offer training courses in spiritual healing and to develop new modalities that incorporate regression linked to communicating with the higher self, an aspect of our consciousness that is anchored in the spiritual realm. This is going to be such a great interview. This is his story and this is his passion. David, welcome to Passion Harvest. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Louisa. It is a delight to be able to share uh, some of the things which have been of interest to me. Uh, and I would add in, I mean, if we get a chance, that sure. uh, I'm deeply passionate also about our connection to the earth, to the consciousness of the earth, and to the energy patterns which make up uh, the, the earth and that level of consciousness. But the primary focus here is obviously to do with the spirit release and trying to understand what is it what is this subject which we're talking about yes oh my gosh I don't know where to start I've got so many questions <laughs> so I guess why do why does so spirits become earthbound I'm assuming when you talk about spirit release they were hum- they were previously in a, a, a physical body in a, spirits in a physical body Yes. Okay. Well, uh, let's go back to, to let's the go beginning. to basics. <laughs> uh, yes. In my understanding, uh, spiritual life has been created, uh, and that spiritual life takes many forms. Uh, we don't have to go into why, why and mm-hmm. uh, what was behind it all, but uh, the, the part of the experience of spiritual life is to come actually into a, a physical body and to experience what it is to be in physicality so i'm taking a step back so one of the things to take on board and uh, this is one of the analogies i sometimes give to my students is to uh, imagine your spirit is like a wonderful cake you might call it the cake in the sky Um, and what happens is periodically we put a slice of that cake down into uh, the physical body uh, and we experience as part of being in the physical body and at the end of that lifetime, a slice of that cake then goes back into the, it connects with the, the cake as a whole, but adding to all of its experiences. So uh, there's a cycle which, which goes on. Now, when we're in the physical body, of course, we're, we're totally focused on what it is to be physical, to experience all the, the gamut of emotions that we go through, uh, sometimes the pain, sometimes the trauma, uh, the joys and all of those experiences. Uh, and they are all unique and they all add to a, to a greater understanding of who and what we are. Um, but one of the difficulties, of course, is when we come into a physical body, part of that experience is to forget where we've come from uh, and the nature of, of our true essence. Mm-hmm. Um, and so uh, we go through a life and some people, of course, in that life, are very caught up in just experience what it is to be physical. Uh, they have no interest in anything, or little interest in anything to do with the spiritual side of themselves. Um, and then they get to the end of the life. Now, 
there's there's a whole group of experiences which I'm sure somewhere along the line you've explored, Louisa, uh, called the near death experience, mm -hmm. where people who are clinically died um, for a period of time before being resuscitated seem to go through uh, an altered state of consciousness where they first of all feel they separate from the physical body. Then they can feel that sometimes they're, they're traveling down the tunnel of light before coming into an, uh, to a sort of other dimension where they uh, will then often meet uh, relatives that have passed over, that they know have passed over, or sometimes a being of light that will communicate with them and to say to them, uh, no, it's not your time uh, to come over yet. And then they return back to the physical body. Uh, it was uh, a Dr. Raymond Moody who first uh, brought this to the world attention back in the, uh, the mid seventies. He's been book. on the show. Yes. He is such a lovely yes, I know, I know Raymond from the past. Uh, so I have met him. Yes. So um, he uh, he brought this to, to public attention. Now, what can sometimes occur in relationship to this this journey? And we're looking at human souls, uh, and I, perhaps that's the best term to use at the moment. Thank you. That's that's prob that's what I meant. <laughs> yes. Yeah, human souls. Um, is that uh, for different reasons? Um, souls once they they lose the physical body can become stuck um, and so instead of making this transitional journey back into the spiritual world they effectively become what you might say is earthbound um, and th there's a range of reasons why uh, that is sometimes to do with beliefs sometimes it's to do with the way in which they died trauma of uh, death um, uh, sometimes it's because they don't even realize that they've died and uh, because in some ways they're still conscious and aware but um, not able to truly understand Transition. what's... Yes, uh, well, they don't realize that the physical body is dead. They go on existing and operating, it's often confused. They, in some cases, not everyone, of course. Um, so you get a, a group of souls that can get stuck um, and it's quite difficult if they're in that mindset for those at a higher spiritual level to be able to communicate with them. I mean, you, uh, we've all had the experience of trying to talk to someone who doesn't want to listen um, and they can just block themselves off from any form of uh, thought. Well, what happens is uh, that uh, these souls then, for, for different reasons, some will be attached to a place. So uh, I, I've done work in the past to, um, to release souls of spirits which are trapped in a house. I, mm -hmm. I mean, simple explanations, uh, going back quite a long time. Uh, I can think of a, uh, I had a group where they, were, they had a, a fear of going to hell because of things which they had done. So um, right. it, it was they were conscious that they were dead, but they didn't want to leave where they were because of a fear factor. So uh, what, what you try to do, and I'll go through the methods of how one can help that, but what you try to do is, is to awaken those uh, spirits up and say, or the souls up and say, um, that they don't need to be stuck, that they, they, they don't need to be trapped in that fear, they can actually be helped to be released. Um, so there's a mixture of reasons. Now you get another group that instead of just um, staying stuck in a place, will sometimes attach to people, maybe uh, uh, friends a, or colleagues. A position, or, is that called position? Well, yes. Um, the, the, it's, it's a question. It, Dealing with, dealing with their spirit release or souls that are stuck in places is, is quite simple. When we come to the situation dealing with the people, it becomes quite complex um, because there's different ways in which these, uh, these souls can attach to people. And, and in most cases, they're not interested in possessing a person. Um, they're in a sort of confused state. Um, they've attached to a person at some level um, and sometimes they just sit beneath the radar so to speak they they are sort of aware that they've connected uh, to someone but they're not in a level that they say they want to take over this person mm -hmm. um, although they will often influence the, the person in some way or another um, 
so it, it's it's and sometimes there's a collusion that goes on uh, between uh, the person that's in incarnation or the uh, incarnate soul uh, and the, the the soul that's attached to them particularly if there's been a uh, family uh, connection you know mother and daughter and uh, or very close friends and and such like so when we're dealing with uh, spirit attachment in relationship to people, it is uh, quite a complex process. Um, in essence, uh, I see my job and uh, those colleagues who work similarly to myself as uh, trying to act as a bridge to assist uh, these souls transition back into the spiritual world. Once they've gone, uh, I don't need to worry about them anymore. There's more than enough help and support which is available. Um, in that uh, spiritual dimension to to look after them and um, it, it, the complexity comes when you're dealing with people in just untangling what's caused them to attach to the person or what's caused the uh, the link and I mean sometimes uh, a soul moving wandering around not knowing will see someone that seems quite open and potentially vulnerable so they may just attach to them uh, for, for no other reason than, than they, they feel some sort of connection to that person. But as I've said, in other cases, it could be through close friends or relationships or things of that nature which go on. Um, and providing one can connect to the soul, you can often just quite easily help them move back uh, in, into the light, to move back into that spiritual dimension. This is fascinating. I'm trying not to get scared, <laughs> but I just want to backtrack. Um, you talked about there's many ways that uh, the earthbound spirits stay earthbound. What about uh, battle scenes or wars? I mean, what do you indeed. find? Have you been to these places and do you find indeed. because they've. Yes, indeed. Oh. Uh, you can go to some battle scenes and you find that uh, the souls still beating hell out of each other, wandering around and. Well, oh, they still are, fighting. Yes. So they can still be fighting. Um, it's 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 complex, uh, obviously, but uh, you, you know souls can get stuck because there's um, such a concentration of people that have died in a particular indeed, location. Indeed, indeed, uh, and it creates a lot of trauma uh, for uh, those souls that are stuck in that. Now, one of the things I would uh, add, Louisa, um, and this is an interesting part. Um, is that, as I said, if we go back to our cake in the sky, um, what you need to appreciate is part of your consciousness is not actually anchored in your physical body. There's a, there's a significant part of your consciousness that is out of the physical body. Um, and again, one of the things that I would encourage people to take on board is to think that this process of incarnation is not just a one-off uh, as Christians would indicate, or Christianity, or some religions indicate, that we just have one life uh, and that's it. From my understanding, we have a, a cycle of lives. So uh, I'm not going to say how many, many, but it might be a dozen, two dozen, whatever lives. And so we spend a period of time in the physical body, we go back into the spiritual world, we reassess what's going on before coming back into the physical body again. Now, obviously, if the, uh, the, the higher part of one's spirit, and let's call it the higher self, is a term which I will use, um, there in the spiritual world becomes aware that part of it is stuck um, because of some trauma. It will sometimes take steps to try to help uh, release that, that problem. So, so in a funny way, um, uh, you, you know, uh, and uh, this is again is something which people may or may not want to take on board, but uh, in where they've had significant battles, you have groups of people who uh, like to go in for battle reenactment. Um, human, they, human, like us as yeah, human. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, you know, there's, there's societies set up, isn't there? Yes, you and know, they dress up. Uh, and they, they dress up in the uniforms and they, they go off there uh, and they have a period of time where they're pretending to knock hell out of each other and then they all go off to the pub and have a drink together. Mm -hmm. and so forth and i sometimes think and indeed i've talked to uh, some some of these individuals uh, that what they're actually doing is releasing some of the catharsis of what might have taken place in a uh, uh, within a previous battle and perhaps in that way helping release 
part of themselves that, that could be stuck. So, uh, you know, there's, there's ways that, that uh, we're able to sort of relive and resort out and re and heal effectively what's gone on in the past. So if, if, if our soul's the cake, that's, that's our soul, and there's multiple pieces of the cake, we can be multiple lives happening at the same time. Is that what you're suggesting? Uh, well, not, not necessarily. Uh, it's because of the, the level of consciousness and the focus of what goes, goes on. Um, I will talk a little bit more about the mul multiplicity of the self because uh, I think when we come to what's going on within us, we could also well, fragment This, this is so getting more have, and more exciting, David. <laughs> <laughs> we have lots of parts of us. But, but to have the sense that the primary consciousness is a spirit which is there in the spiritual world. Um, and so one way of differentiating between the spirit and the soul, you could say the spirit is our greater consciousness, it's the totality of all we are. And the soul is just the bit of the spirit which is anchored in the physical body, mm -hmm. which is there for a particular lifetime. And actually what happens for us is the same as what happens for cats, dogs, trees, and so on. So uh, we, we live in a multi multiverse of consciousness, if you like. Um, but normally what happens is because of the focus and the the experience of what goes on in a particular life, there needs to be a, uh, quite a lot of focus of, of connection to that one life. So if you can imagine the, the spirit in the spiritual world, if it was trying to deal with dozens of lives at the same time, it would just be overwhelming. So there's a, there's a sense that broadly speaking, um, we, we come into a life and, and there would only be one, uh, uh, if you like, part of us in a particular life. Um, on occasions, there may be, there may be two, um, but it, for the most part, we, we would only ever normally incarnate a part of ourselves in any one period. Um, and broadly speaking, it's generally sequential to what's going on in the historical perspective. Um, although when we're dealing with things at a spiritual level, they're sort of outside of time and space. So it might be possible for a spirit to have an incarnation in the 21st century and then go back and have an incarnation in Roman times, for example. Um, but I don't want to, to make it too complex. Well, this. no, I talk about this all the time. This is fine. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> if that's I talk case, about no time a lot. <laughs> Yes. Well, it's recognizing, of course, the physical body is anchored in time and space, whereas our spirit is not. It's outside of time and space. And so uh, our spirit can be everywhere and nowhere at the same time. Um, and not even you know, it, time is fluid. Um, so I would, I would certainly take on board all of that. But it's all to do with the evolution of consciousness, the expansion of consciousness, the expansion of awareness which uh, is part of what our soul is, uh, is awakening to, our spirit is awakening to. Uh, and this is the whole reason for the evolution of the soul. If, well, I, was, uh, if I was to ask yes, you, this is probably I, I, at the end when I say, what's it all for? But yeah, I think you just well, answered uh, the question. What sits, sits behind it, um, I think, is the evolution of consciousness throughout the, the multiverses of, uh, of <laughs> where we exist so um and, and there's a certain you know elements of all of this that that need to be understood and accepted first of all for that to occur each spirit has to have free will uh, because if everything is predetermined and pre-programmed um that free will uh, uh, you would not get any expansion or new things coming forward so so the free will element is very significant uh, and important but what happens is that your spirit in the spiritual world you sit down with other likes like-minded spirits decide what sort of life you want to have what are the learning lessons you want to achieve uh, and then you find um, parents that you feel that uh, can help provide that that background that that life and so there's an intent that comes forward when we incarnate as i said uh, what happens is that when we come into the physical body, we forget where we've come from. And there's some good reasons for that. Uh, one is um, if, the, if we were totally aware of, of the dimension from where we've come, um, because it's such a loving, benign 
um, space to be um, coming into a life where you might have to learn some challenging or go through some challenging experiences um, if we were totally aware of that side it become would become exceptionally difficult to deal with uh, those experiences um, and uh, the tendency would then be to want to to finish one's life and you know to just go back into the realm it's rather like mm -hmm. um, uh, you know someone there going leaving home and, and going um, uh, on holiday somewhere and um, and uh, when they arrive, it's such a horrible place. They think, no, I don't want to be here. I don't want to see this holiday out. I want to go straight back home. So uh, that's one of the reasons why we forget. I won't go into all of them, but anyway, just to accept. We go through this amnesiac space where we come into the physical body and then we, we have to learn to deal with and cope with what's going on, to go through the experiences which we need to do. And hopefully at some point, um, uh, the spirit or the soul will begin to wake up and think, ah, oh, there has to be something else, and then to begin to explore something of this other dimensional part of who and what we are. And from there to begin to make the connections with uh, whatever you see as that wise knowing part of yourself. And so that becomes the theme, and you then can begin to weave in the different elements of what you want to achieve in, in the life. Um, uh, to take it forward to conclusion. So, so, so there is a thread, there is a, a pattern which runs through people's lives. Now, sometimes, obviously, uh, and this is the other key bit, is when the spirit, you, you come with the plan, so the part comes into the pod, body with the plan, but every stage where you separate out, if you like, you create another part of yourself, that part also has free will. So the, the higher self part in the spiritual world can't say, uh, David, you've got to do this. Um, once the bit of my soul that comes into me then has free will to choose exactly which way I go and how I deal with things uh, and so forth. So, so that becomes part of the, uh, the thread. And at each stage, uh, when we separate off bits of ourselves, um, each part has its free will options so so the universe is based upon uh consideration and cooperation that's as you like you can't just force things people to do things or force situation you have to learn to negotiate and cooperate with these different parts does that make sense it sure does but so when you i mean my question i've got a couple i've got so many questions and i really want to move on fate and free will is it the same thing um, well, what I would say um, is that, remember that, that, that there was a plan before you came into a physical mm -hmm. body, Louisa, in my perspective, from my understanding, you sat down with your guides, those beings that love you, care for you, and you agree, these are the things I want to achieve in my life. Um, and so you have that intent, that plan, and that plan is held within your inner soul essence, which sits within you. Now, most, most people are not truly connected to the soul part of okay. themselves. They're not also aware of the soul part of themselves. And, and so often the ego mind starts to, uh, to take over and, and has an idea of what it wants to achieve, the things that, that seem important for it. And if there is levels of disconnect between what's going on in the soul and the ego mind, then, the, uh, the, then you can get the, the person sometimes going off on track you know not going on on the following the things they need to follow um what will happen is then the soul part will sometimes try to correct that for, from within sometimes uh, you know, one of the reasons which would often bring forward uh, uh changes uh, in relationship to a person um is uh, sometimes people go through very major crises or uh, they, they might have a severe illness or something of that nature, which makes them stop and begin to think and reflect uh, and to take on stock where they're going, what's happening in their life. And then they can some, often would then make changes within themselves. They begin to awaken to the fact that they're not just an ego self. There's something deeper that's happening within. So um, in that way, I would see um, how patterns are working out. You could say that there is a, like a karma, there is a life plan that we have, but whether we adhere to that plan or how that plan is adhered to is dependent upon our free will choices 
um, and uh, and so you get that mixture of free will, um, kismet, fate, fortune, whatever term you want to 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 put to it, coincidences, um, you know, connections. So it's 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 being aware of uh, how that works out. Gosh, this I'm going off topic again. I, I'm, I'm going to get back to spirit release, but. When we make those major decisions, so I'm Louise, I make major decisions that alter my path, or perhaps I'm going back onto my path. Um, are, are there multiple timelines that Louise is living on? Well, I think that's a very interesting uh, philosophical idea, uh, Louise. Uh, one, of the, one of the things which I, I work with uh, sometimes, I mean, uh, when you're working with... Um, uh, part of the spirit release journey is not just the releasing of spirit it's trying to understand what's going on for us i have some trauma I have some issue i have some problem um, and sometimes that problem might not come from this current life it might come from from the past life um and uh, if we just take the the past life scenario for example you know if you've been caught up in the uh some battle or you've uh, gone through some traumatic experience in a past life that's caused part of you to be stuck, then part of the journey of going inside of the, oneself. And I would add in here that from my perspective, we all have this deeply wise knowing part, and I'll go back to this term, the higher self, which is sat there in this, the spiritual world, which is monitoring all the things which are going on. So your higher self, uh, Louisa, knows you inside out, back to front, knows not only um, past lives uh, on all the things which could happen, but also potential future lives. Mm -hmm. So all of that sits within us. Now, from a therapeutic pers perspective, I don't know if I was working with you, I don't know all of what your higher self knows, your higher self knows it. But if I can get you into a, a sort of altered state of consciousness where your higher self can then say to you, look, Louisa, there's a traumatic life you had in the 1800s that is causing some of the issues and problems for you today. And there may be spirits which are involved in that, but it may be just simply uh, sorting out and dealing with the, the trauma from that, that lifetime. Uh, and so by going into a sort of slightly regressed state, but it's when you get into the process, it's not so difficult to do. And certainly mm -hmm. some people find it very easy to begin to connect into to where that trauma is and to begin to relieve that. And one way to reassess that trauma is to take on board that actually there could have been different outcomes. There could have been different ways that that could have been understood. And so whilst... Uh, you could say, you know, I'm taken to hanged or whatever, taken to the scaffold. Maybe there is other ways that that could be appreciated where, uh, in fact, you, you were not hanged. There was different outcomes. Mm -hmm. So one way of beginning to help the, the soul readjust and reassess things is to begin to recognize that in one way, um, there are potential parts of you that are experiencing in alternate different ways. Lives. Alternate lives. Yeah, alternate lives. And, and that's uh, because you, you're, you're dealing with consciousness. You're dealing with something which is not necessarily fixed in the same way that it is within us. And that consciousness can be fluid. It can see different outcomes. And, uh, and so in that way, it all becomes part of a, of a greater experience. Gosh, this is just so fascinating. But <laughs> I guess we better get back to the, the 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 spirit release or the spirits. How do you know that? Do you do you visually see them? Do you sense them? How do you know that there's uh, spirits? Uh, well, in, in relationship to um, spirits, in, in, as far as places are concerned, yeah. I'm not all the time walking around trying to look and see you know what can I see with, with different uh, spirits mm -hmm. I really rely on on sort of what something within me might prompt me to become aware of so okay. if some situation goes on that says you know I need to look at this then I will uh, I would choose to to look at that particular situation uh, but very often it comes out of people who um, uh, when you're dealing with places could uh, have trauma going on in their house there's something disturbed they sometimes are aware they sometimes feel right it feels that maybe so someone else is living here um and i i mean i'll give you a very 
going back many, many years. Sure. Um, uh, I was probably one of my first times when I did any of this work on my own, I'm very early 20s. Um, and I was living in an area of Cheltenham. Um, the, the, we had um, properties which dated back into about the um, 1880s or whatever. Um, and I got to know a, a couple who were living in a few, few houses away from me. He was an architect. And I went and uh, was, was going around there for tea one time, sat there talking with him. And I knew they were sort of sort of interested in all these um, these areas, but only in a very mild way. And he was telling me all of the problems he was having with, he was trying to get uh, building firms in to sort out whole lot of alterations that he wanted uh, to, to do in the property and he kept saying I can't understand it because you know the builders come and then they don't put the, the quotes in you know it's a whole lot of issues and problems kept going on and as he was talking I was suddenly aware of this uh, man a spirit soul which was there in the house um, I could see him he had braces on he had a white shirt he had rolled up sleeves and he was furious that someone was in his house trying to change it all Gosh. and so, do you uh, see him in your mind's eye i was i see him in my mind's eye okay. i'm just absolutely conscious of him i don't it's not quite seeing it as i see you yes, but yes. it's like in my mind's eye yeah. i'm seeing this um and so i said to this uh, this um uh, this man and uh, his wife was there i said look i think you've got a problem that i think there's a spirit here that's in your house which is causing the problem just hang on a moment i'll talk to this spirit to see whether I can help the spirit move on. So I closed my eyes. I then communicated with him telepathically. You sort of talk to them in, the, in your mind. And this, um, uh, I tried to, I, of course, got this uh, spirit's attention. I got him to, to began to realize that in fact, he was he was dead. I got him to be aware that, him, that his wife was there, wanting to connect to him. And, you know, within a very short space of time, he just up and left. And he was quite happy. But I mean, he told me, first of all, he was really furious that people were in his house um, trying to mess about with it. He didn't want it. So know, he thought he was alive. He thought he was alive. But the souls, when they're, they're in that space, are in a sort of confusion because they can't understand why they can't communicate easily with people who are in the house. Um, uh, so he hadn't recognized that he had, he had actually died. And you don't need to know precisely why he died or what had happened yes. he could have died in sleep or whatever but but from his point of view he was still alive anyway um uh you know my friends uh particularly um uh the the, the man who was sat there he had felt as soon as he'd done the work he felt the whole room go cold and he didn't know whether to scream run out of the room in <laughs> terror or whatever but i was able to calm him down and say look no it's all clear it's gone Everything's fine. Um, you, you needn't worry anymore. And from that point on, absolutely no more problems. Uh, you know, the builders came in, did the work, and uh, no issues. So, you know, there can be different different reasons why uh, why these souls get stuck. Now, uh, that's dealing with the soul or spirit is in the place. So, really, all you're trying to do is wake into to that spirit. And now, what I normally do is, as soon as I'm aware of the spirit. I call on their higher self to get them to connect uh, to that soul, begin to wake, waken that soul to the fact that they don't need to be stuck here on the earth plane anymore. And very soon they go. Um, the complexity comes, well, as I said, when you're dealing with, with souls which are attached to people. So I, I, just, don't know. I just know, I just wanted to ask, I mean, everyone hears about haunted houses and do you get a lot of calls or communication from people asking you to clear their house and um, I, I do have, uh, I do have some, yes, um, uh, because I'm interested in, in doing that. So helping clear the basic, and it can all most of the time they can all be done from a distance. So, oh, so you, you can do them remotely. Visit. Yeah, you can do them remotely. And have you come across some negative ones? Uh, Are the there, is of, there such a like we see in the movies? Um, well, one of the, uh, again, one of the complexities in relationship to what goes on on this, uh, this dimension, uh, and I don't want to you know, 
the, the trouble is movies want to sensationalize uh, things in a way. Yeah. Uh, but one of the things, of course, to take on board is that all souls have free will and, and some souls can choose to want to uh, experience things in a negative way. Um, you know, they, they get stuck. For the most part, um, souls which are stuck in places are just lost. Um, very occasionally you will find a soul with a sort of a malign intent is probably the best way of putting mm -hmm. it. Um, and they need to be approached in, in a slightly different way. But what you're effectively, what I'm effectively trying to do is to, because every soul that's, that's stuck also has light within it. It also has a part of, um, best way of putting it, you know, a, a sort of divine consciousness bit inside of itself, sure. because that's all part of it. And so if you can awaken that, you begin to help shift what's going on within the uh, within the individual um and that the same thing applies you know someone maybe when they're when they're younger you know commits some uh some crime or other and, and does something uh bad it doesn't necessarily mean to say that they can't also be then helped to come to terms with what they've done and and to to then go back into um uh, to be able to help to move back into a place of restitution effectively. And that's really what's going on within the universe. Um, you know, you, you and I could have had lives, and I know I certainly have, where um, I've done things which I can, from a spiritual perspective, then think back, mm -hmm. uh, that wasn't such a wise thing to, to do and to carry a sense of guilt or shame <clears throat> around all of that and then feel somewhere along the line I need to expedite that um that guilt or that shame or maybe to go through the very experience which i've caused other people to go through mm -hmm. so that's part of how if you like there's a rebalancing that goes on uh, in a sense of a you know whole karmic uh, perspective of, of uh, you know the spiritual evolution and ultimately uh, again in my perspective uh, souls get to a point where they've said, you know, done the physical bit, don't need to go on experiencing here. We now need to begin to experience on other dimensions. And part of the experiencing on other dimensions is beginning to wake up to the consciousness which exists um, in other dimensions. And um, one of the things which I have a great interest in, which is another bizarre area, but is learning to communicate with trees. Because trees have... The I love that. Universe. I think that's fantastic. Yeah, trees have an enormously profound uh, awareness. And if we can learn to communicate with them just at the physical level, that opens up something. But at a spiritual level, what I think happens, um, and again, it's come out of my sort of guidance, support, uh, inspiration, if you like, is that um, ultimately what happens is if I'm going to grow in consciousness, I need to expand and be aware of what other people's consciousness, what their experiences are about. And I think the analogy, simple analogy, is like to think, OK, you've got all of your experiences, uh, Louisa, I've got mine. But if we could actually connect up and imagine you're a computer and I'm a computer, we can connect up and I could begin to download my experiences into you and you could download your experiences into me. So ultimately, we start to uh, encompass the experiences of um, other souls, other beings. Uh, and that's what I think starts to happen at a, at a greater spiritual level, that, that that process of assimilation goes on. There's still, in my understanding, there is still always the uniqueness, which uh, is me. So, you know, there's a unique part of consciousness. It just doesn't have um you know become a, a great soup if you like yeah. of, uh, or like the ocean um the individuality somehow is still retained within it because there's all the evidence of guides coming forward of uh, you know higher spiritual beings communicating with us which suggests at some level there is still that uh, unique individuated consciousness which is uh, which is us but it's how that expands itself to understand and so forth and it's by learning to communicate with other species other beings uh, that we can do this and to simulate something of their experiences just fascinating so, so on to on on to on to people with spirit attachments yes well what's as i said the the 
the, what you're trying to do is to help a person be able to go inside of themselves. So when I'm working with a client, um, for the most part, I want them to also participate in the experience. Um, I recognize obviously you get some uh, situations where maybe from a healing perspective, I can try to uh, work remotely to deal with whatever's going on and the person's inner world. But one of the things to take on board, and this is where we get into this idea that we're all multiple personalities. Uh, I've talked about our essential core self, which is within us, which psychology is sometimes called the self or the, um, you know, from the past, it was looked upon the soul, but then we also know we have an ego mind part. Now, one of the situations which occurs as we come into a physical body is that sometimes within trauma, uh, when trauma occurs, uh, the trauma becomes overwhelming to the extent that uh, the soul creates a, a split off part of itself to hold the trauma. So uh, one of the things which psychologists and the psychotherapists have begun to recognize, in fact, there's different parts inside of us, different characters which sit inside of us. Some of those characters can be quite healthy and fine. Um, so um, you can think of uh, your own self or myself. I can think of a, a, you know, the David that sat here talking to you uh, is different from the David that's going out walking in the, the countryside. Mm -hmm. um, a, a different part of me comes forward or the, the David that is um, writing a book or the David that is uh, you know, working with a client on a one-to-one -one basis. You know, there's different characters. Well, the different sometimes, hats, people call it sometimes. Yes, different hats. Different hats. But, but you can almost think, uh, and once you become aware of it, it's almost like a whole different part of you comes in with, with, a, with its own perspective, mm -hmm. if you like, which is, they're all connected. So it's, we can think of ourselves as like a, a family. But sometimes in the, the family, you get uh, parts where uh, there's been trauma or issues or problems. And sometimes those parts can get disconnected. Sometimes those parts can get buried. Um, and, and sometimes those parts can have um, spirits which attach to them. So uh, what, what happens then is you get these trauma, particularly in childhood, uh, it's not specifically childhood, but particularly in childhood, uh, you get traumatized split off parts. And these parts become vulnerable sometimes to spirits attaching to them or connecting to them. Um, and uh, then what you're trying to do is to ask through the higher self to bring you in touch with the part where the trauma is. And if you connect to the part where the trauma is, then you can begin to see, is it just um, the person's caught in a state of fear? You know, the simple example would be, uh, if um, as a three-year-old you had got um, chased by a dog or attacked by a dog, there's a whole fear bit inside of you. In ordinary life, uh, sometimes as we grow into adulthood, we can work through those fears by looking at them and that helps that traumatized part mm -hmm. begin to release it, its fear. But sometimes these parts get quite deeply buried and uh, they need to be communicated with and brought to the surface. And uh, sometimes what you can find is that um, spirits will attach to some of these uh, parts and, and then get woven into to what's going on within the psyche. But the, the, the essence is, is that you, we all have a deeply wise part and that deeply wise part can uh, bring forth the insights as to what's going on, what's happened. When you get childhood um, spirits attached, very often they get so woven into the to the psyche of the person that the person themselves, they grow to adulthood, is not necessarily all conscious and aware that they have these parts. It's only uh, it's only when they hit some particular traumas that they can be brought, uh, sometimes get brought to the surface. Um, but uh, when you're in as an adult, then very often you're more conscious and aware of something's attached. You just feel something's there. I, you know, I can't understand what's what's going on. And in those cases, um, it's sometimes easier to release uh, what's happening. And one of the analogies you, you might like to take on board and think of yourself as is to, or metaphors, is to think of yourself as a house. So you have the house, you have Louisa in the house, you have, uh, you, you have different parts of you, you know, 
or kids or other adults in the house, you know, you're all cooperating together. Um, but sometimes what happens is one of these parts might invite in a stranger from outside to come into the house. And, uh, and then if that stranger gets in the house, they may get sort of assimilated into, into, the, into the house. Um, but they may, um, they may then also create possibly a problem uh, that, that's going on. So when you start to think of ourselves in that way, uh, you can begin to see that we have different characters which is inside of us. Some of those characters might be part of you, but some might not. And it's the ones that might not that need to sometimes be sorted out. Um, uh, but you can sometimes get um, spirits which would just don't get inside the house. They just sit in the garden, so to speak, um, you know, pitch their tent there, take up residence because that's where they think they're going to, uh, you know, some form of connection. And, uh, and yet, nevertheless, they're still creating some form of uh, influence or disturbance. So it's, it's how people take on board all of this area and begin to understand it within themselves. It is... In one level, it's complex, but the principles behind it are relatively straightforward and, and, and simple. Um, and it, the essence of it is, from my point of view, when I'm working with someone, is how can I help them be in touch with this wonderfully wise, knowing part of themselves, and from that part to begin to then look at and heal, you know, if there's trauma or there's bits which are there within themselves, what can be done to help sort them out and release them? and help them uh, move back into the light, really. Just to tid tidy up what's going on within one's inner world. So you're obviously able to re remove that spirit attachment or possession from the individual? Yeah, uh, yes, it is um, it is complex, because sometimes there's, there's all sorts of entanglements uh, that, that go on. And all the time you need to have the collaboration and. Uh, agreement that's going on for within the self so although the higher self has as a complete overview uh, the higher self part of us um, can uh, if all parts are in agreement so if all the characters inside of you say you know we, we've got uh, some characters got in somewhere along the line um, you know as we can just think of it in the ordinary uh, analogy point of view you know someone turns up on the door you know presents I, i'm the police officer can you let me in and so, so you think oh well better let this person in and uh, the, the character gets in and then it turns out that in fact he's, he's not the police officer he's a he's complete fraud and he's in to try to um you know rob parts of what's going on or create some problems well as long as all of the characters in the within the house are in full agreement that uh, this person needs to go, the higher self can step in and just remove them. Uh, and then they, they have to go. But if there's um, a part, I mean, to give you an example, um, I'm working with a client, uh, a client that's a little bit of time ago, where um, we detected that was some intruder who got within us, she was aware of it, it was causing some disruption. Uh, and then we had to find, uh, you know, what, what was it? What was the part of her that allowed this in? And she became aware uh, of a four-year-old child part who at the time was going through quite a bit of trauma, felt very lonely, and this character had turned up um, and became the friend of this child. So the um, so from the from the child's point of view, she didn't want this this character to go because it was her friend. Um, obviously, you know, she, she was um, she wanted um, him to still stay there. Now, unfortunately, of course, this was a mask because this character was was not really there to to in a, in a benign way it sort of tricked its way into into her. so we had then had to talk to the child to bring the child into a space where she could begin to uh, at least be aware that it would be important and helpful for this character to not not be there and we were able to help the child sort whatever the child out needed so she got to the point say yes and as long, as long as he's going to be all okay and from my point of view i'm not uh, in the, when I'm working with trying to release any of these spirits, I'm not trying to, um, to harm them or hurt them or what have you. I want to establish the fact that, that uh, the individual has uh, the right to have their own space free of any outside intrusion, um, but uh, to help whatever that character is to, to 
go to a place where they're going to be looked after and they're going to be okay. And, and the child was, was eventually happy with all of that. And as soon as that was done, this, uh, this character had to leave. So um, the higher self can step in and make sure everything's okay, as long as all the bits are in agreement with that. And that's, you know, that's where it starts to become uh, complex because you can sometimes get some parts which um, you know, want to hold on to things from the past. Um, so, yes. So how does one know if they have a possession or a spirit attachment? Um, well, normally it will come out in some, something within the individual's uh, self where they're beginning to feel uh, not okay. They begin to sense that something that's, that, that's an issue and a problem that's going on within them. Sometimes people will embark upon uh, exploring uh, themselves from a different uh, therapeutic perspective. I, uh, you know, the people might um, uh, go and have past life regression and suddenly begin to think, mm, there's something else going on here. Um, uh, and you know, I, for the, in many cases, uh, people can just be aware that something's not right, but not yet have uh, the sense of knowing how to begin to to resolve it um, so I, I don't want to open up and I certainly within my uh, therapeutic practice I've not got uh, space to suddenly take on board you know lots of other uh, people what I would like to see is far more therapists who have uh, the sort of awareness that I have and uh, training in ways where they can begin to help people deal with these these areas um, and so if your life is going fairly smoothly everything's okay don't just think oh i must have got something uh, uh you know have i got something problematic uh, because he uh, you know fear is also an um, uh, an energy that we need to be aware of and i the last thing i want to do is to create a sense of fear um in in what i'm presenting here because i think intrinsically although we can look at some of the very difficult traumas that are going on on the planet at the moment intrinsically i feel that the universe is benign it's not it's there trying to help us evolve and work through and deal with uh situations and um in a way it, it's it's opening up to you know a higher dimensional level of uh, consciousness and and awareness uh, and that's why i think uh, you know individuals can also get a lot of support and help through being out in nature so you're kind of like to, a ghostbuster, really, aren't you? Um, <laughs> Have you been called that before? Yes, in, in some senses, yes. I mean, ghostbusting is what, what they're talking about. But effectively, what I'm, I'm trying to do, and of course, when you get something like ghostbusters, of course, uh, the vast majority of all the uh, images that are presented is, uh, uh, is very, um, you know, malign, discordant, horrific, mm -hmm. nasty sort of splodges of energy. Um, and in fact, that's far from the case. Um, there are obviously some which are um, problematic, but for the most part, uh, it's just that the souls are, are lost or the spirits are lost. And what you're trying to do is help them find their way back home. You know, it's, uh, uh, that's the way I would uh, take it on board rather than, uh, you know, to, to, to think of all of the uh, scenarios which you see in some of the, the ghost busting um, yes. films. Um, you know, the, the, the universe, as I've said, inherently, I think, is loving, supportive, kind. And if we can open up to that, that in itself becomes... I mean, it, to think, Louisa, we all have a profoundly wise knowing part of us anchored in the spiritual world, which is there to help and support us. It won't make decisions for you. It won't tell you whether to eat this biscuit and not eat that biscuit but it's there in a loving, supportive way to help provide insight and guidance in relationship to how you go forward in your life. Maybe giving a sense of the steps that need to be taken uh, in how you go forward in your life. And that support uh, can be called upon um, at any point. I mean, if world leaders could take on board and think about they have a wild, you know, a, a, amazingly wise part of themselves and to bring that wisdom through. Just think of the changes which could take place in relationship to how some of them act. Mm -hmm. Instead of acting out of a very, 
egotistical uh, materialistic perspective uh, it opens up to a whole other dimension of of awareness um, and really the world needs leaders at every level to be open to to a sort of higher wisdom uh, that we can communicate with and one of the difficulties at the moment one of the big rubicons which i think we all have to um, deal with is that there's there's quite a, a powerful segment of uh, society that that um, doesn't believe in in consciousness continuing after after death so it sees consciousness purely in human terms um, but if we could begin to take on board that consciousness is far greater than that that in, that we have an intrinsic part of us that is part of a cycle of experience then that in itself would begin to open up to a whole other perspective that I think could be uh, a dramatic sea change. It could create a dramatic sea change in how we go forward and how we deal with the situations. You know, we've got enormous areas of problem like climate change and all of these sorts of things where we need to awaken to, to other levels of consciousness, to be aware that the earth is also a living being if you like and that all the parts of this planet are precious and need to be cared for and need to be uh, loved and valued uh, and appreciated um, and that doesn't mean to say that we can't work with nature in a cooperative sense because I believe we can I think nature is more than willing to work with us and I certainly um, you know I know from my communication with the trees and that sounds bizarre I just say something about this um, uh going back for oh, 1990s i mean i've always been aware of sort of other dimensions uh, and i have sort of um, aware of sometimes communication coming through uh, but i was stood by a lake um back in the early 1990s one day just looking out at the lake a beautiful scene and i was suddenly aware of this voice talking to me in my head saying um, just just sort of greeting me saying hello and making some other comments and when i began to assess where this was coming from, I realized that it was an oak tree that was stood next to me that was communicating with me. So I thought, okay, so I started to allow this communication to, to go forward. And the oak tree began to tell me all sorts of things about itself. It told me that um, uh, the trees, there are Mr. Trees and Mrs. Trees, and we can, we can begin to recognize that trees are not just trees, they they have their, their different qualities. And going back into the 1990s, it told me how they communicated through their roots. There's an incredible amount of communication. It told me all sorts of things. So I thought, well, this is, this is really interesting. So I spent, spent a bit of time going around talking to trees and they were telling me an enormous amount how they communicated around the, the planet. They talk now about the, the wood wide web, um, that, that the there are this, this, yeah, this communication. So all of this information that I was given, and I got to a point where I thought, you yeah, know, this is, is this for real? Uh, is it me just being totally deluded, um, opening up to bizarre levels of, of consciousness and so forth? Uh, until so I, I put, I was holding that thought, thinking about that, and I was stood next, next one day next to a, uh, an Atlantic cedar tree talking to this tree and when the tree suddenly said oh by the way um i gave some healing to a friend of yours uh, some time ago and i thought well, that's a bit of interesting information i can go and check that out so um and the next time i saw this friend um uh and you know she again was sort of interested in, in some of these uh all weird and wild ideas um wacky ideas um but I said to her, well, I've been talking with a, a particular tree that says it has a connection with you. And I, I think I only said that. And she said, I know the tree you mean. Wow. Um, now, if you think about that, you just go outside your door and have a look at all the trees in your neighborhood. Um, there are thousands. And what she said to me was, um, and, she, and it was exactly the, the tree, was the tree um she said to me that uh, uh probably two years ago uh, three years previous to that she um she'd been in a in a state of real distress because her husband had just recently passed over and uh, she said she went and sat under this tree um at that point and 
uh, she said, she, I spent most of the day just sobbing my heart out. But she, she said, I really felt the tree help me. And it was, it, it was a really transformative experience. And she said, from then on, I've always had a sense of connection with that particular tree. Now, I thought to myself, OK, um, some of the stuff I picked up about trees might be completely off the wall. Um, although what's happened with science is started to verify some of the stuff. But I thought, you know, I couldn't deny that communication with that tree had told me something that I didn't know before and was then verified in a way that seemed very evidential, very, very powerful. So I've, since then I've taken on board and thought, yes, actually, um, you know, I, I can communicate with trees and everyone can learn to do it. I don't think it's, I don't think it's actually difficult. Um, you know, it's finding a tree and opening up to just feel into what the, what the tree, what the tree might be saying to you, what it would be talking about. Um, and trees have told me all sorts of fascinating things. I, I was talking with a tree and it said, wouldn't you have preferred to incarnate as a human being? No way, this tree said. <laughs> human beings walk around with boxes over their head. They can't see beyond, beyond their own blinkered vision. Um, I would much prefer to be a tree because I have a sense of being able to communicate with all sorts of life around, all sorts of levels of consciousness, which we are, most people are just totally unaware. So, you know, uh, what can I, what can one say to that? Own inner soul essence, you have a sense of connection uh, to your higher self, so you have this wise part. How can I allow that to begin to come forward for me? How can I begin to uh, develop these parts inside of myself? And, and one of the simplest ways, uh, again, come back to trees or plants, I mean, uh, or animals, you know, the, the, how can I begin to communicate in a sort of telepathic sense? With, our, with another species, you know, to open up my mind to think if I'm talking to them, what, what messages might they be giving me? What's the feeling inside of my body that I might be experiencing? Um, what you find is that normally communication can take place on sort of four, sometimes five levels. But, but the obvious one is some people have very good clairvoyant vision. So, so, so they begin to see pictures in their mind very easily. Um, and, and uh, in a sense, if you communicate with a tree, you might get pictures of this sort of like cables expense, expanding out from the tree, connecting with other trees or, or whatever. Um, so the visual is one. The auditory is another. And probably from my point of view, uh, the auditory and, and the, so, so it's what you hear. And it's as though there's a voice going on in your head talking to you. Um, and, and I realize that so that can be an issue for some people because if they're getting voices which are, um, well, these are the parts generally themselves which are talking to them, um, which are causing the problems um, and they need to be understood. But you can learn to develop that in the same way that we're communicating, um, but we could be communicating telepathically. So I might be hearing you asking the questions in my mind rather than uh, you articulating them. Oh, this could be a really interesting interview. <laughs> I wouldn't even need to do anything. Well, I would. I would just in my mind. Yeah. Yes. Um, and another level is through, through the feeling, the emotional sense. So it, it's, it's really saying, you know, just if I'm in this place, do I feel happy or do I feel sad? You know, what, what's the emotions that, that are coming up for me? And the last level is, is the kinesthetic. It's what you're experiencing in your physical body. And uh, it, it's uh, the, the sense you, know, you stand next to a tree and you might get a whole feeling of goosebumps or um, uh, other uh, those sort of sensations which, which go on. And certainly when I'm working therapeutically with people, uh, if people have trauma, very often they feel it anchored in a particular part of their body. Yeah, you know, someone who's being hanged might suddenly feel as though they're being choked and there's a real physical sensation that's going on. So it's thinking of those. And, and the last one is sometimes you just have a knowingness inside of you that, you know, sort of, I just know this to be true. I don't know why I know this to be true. I just know this to be true. Um, so we can learn to listen to these subtle parts of ourselves. Um, but to do it, we need to sort of take on board that there is this other uh, complex world in which we exist. And so we, we, we can learn to communicate at a distance with people. Um, you know, I'm sure you must have had 
cases where uh, you're suddenly thinking of someone and the next minute the phone yes. goes and they're, and they're, they're talking course. to you or yeah. um, because it's it's this communication which is which is taking place now I know science has not got any explanation for that because it's uh, from the most part it's operating outside of the electromagnetic spectrum but it's understanding how consciousness has to weave in and out of the the physical realm that we know but consciousness also exists independent of that uh, physicality that's so it's, well thank you that you know that that's great things to explore on a final note i just want to ask you how how, do, how does one protect themselves spiritually um i think uh, the the key bit is i mean you can imagine yourself surrounded by a, a bubble of light a bubble of uh, love and light and actually you know the greatest protector of all in greek myths um if the goddess aphrodite turns up and says louisa i'm giving you my girdle in the myths it says that even the thunderbolts of zeus would fall harmlessly at your feet oh. so so in one sense uh, the greatest protector of all is love uh, it's truly having a sort of loving compassionate uh, energy but you know just feeling yourself in your own bubble of light your own sense of uh, coherence within yourself and for the most part then uh, you know things will be fine and okay so it's maybe how we can learn to be more loving and compassionate in all the things we uh, uh, we do yes I completely agree is there anything else you'd like to talk to the passion harvest audience about David <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, in the interest probably, of time well there is no time you, but <laughs> yes as you probably gathered i can go on uh oh no i've on. loved you talking you can talk as long as you want um is there anything more um what would i what i would say is the earth at this moment in time is going through an enormous transformation and what I think is really important is for people to uh, look at those areas which keep them back through fear and also to look at those areas which maybe create a problem them through them through shame and guilt. Fear and shame and guilt are the two big areas which tend to keep people stuck. But if we can move through that, um, I, I sometimes refer to these as the two great initiatory journeys, um, which are so beautifully encapsulated in mythology. Um, the heroes have to go out and slay their bit, uh, slay, their, slay the dragons, you know, to, mm -hmm. to, to deal with the fear, to move through the fear. Um, and the, the other great mythological story is how to learn to love the unlovable. So it's how do we learn to transform which comes out in stories like Beauty and the Beast. It, it's, the, it's learning to love that which feels unlovable in ourselves. So these are the two great aspects that we need to move through, not only individually, but collectively. And it's very easy for us to get stuck in that. And also, uh, it just opens up to a whole other area really <laughs> how human beings tend we tend to project out onto the world the bits of us which we can't readily understand and heal and balance within ourselves so it's it's trying to look at uh, individuals uh, so forth in as benign a way as you possibly can if if we get angry and upset and furious about things all from my point of view you're doing is feeding that uh, that anger, that fury, and so forth. And that's particularly comes out when you think of uh, some of the things which are going on on the planet. So how do we learn to, uh, to balance those energies inside of ourselves? But the key part is also to, to awaken to, the, to that wonderful universe and the wonderful planet on which, I mean, this planet is extraordinary on what it offers us in relationship to its beauty, um, all of the uh, you know the consciousness which exists around us so so to believe that we are in a transition space and I sincerely hope and believe that uh, uh, you know human beings as a species will be able to let go of all of their need to want to go on fighting and trying to to dominate other people to really respect 
free will, as long as that free will um, is not expressed in a ways that inhibits the free will of others. So, you know, this is a delicate balance, isn't it? But you can see of what's going on at the moment um, in, um, in Myanmar, where you get one group which is trying to suppress another group. Uh, and we need to move beyond all of that. We need to learn to work cooperatively together uh, for leaders to come forward in a, in a sense that uh, they respect inherently the free will that it sits within their citizens, all of the citizens. Now, I know we have to work as a collective group, so there needs to be some levels of laws and so forth, which we have instituted, but they need to be done in a way that really allows and, it, and this fundamental part, uh, the free will expression. How can individuals think and feel and express themselves in ways that um, allow for their spiritual self to go on growing, but obviously um, if they want to use their free will to dominate others, then obviously that needs to be, there needs to be ways of curtailing that. Um, and not in a, in a sort of um, human interaction sense, but I mean where, um, you know, the, 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 the real free will expression is being uh, uh, restrained and people are being coerced to do things in a way that's not, that's not appropriate. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's finding a way through um, all the things which are, which are going on. And as you can see, we've still got a long way to go. But the more that people can awaken to this, this other dimensional part of themselves, to believe that they have a deeply wise part that they can call upon for help. Um, and that part would always listen to me, it won't necessarily take away what the, the issue is. So if I'm going through some experience and that part, uh, my higher self says, this is something you've got to go through, David. Um, uh, it won't just stop me going through it, but it will give me the support and help and insight so that I can go through that experience in the most creative, beneficial way possible. So I'm a believer in the, in the in positive outcome for humanity. Um, uh, and I think we have a way of moving into a greater level of awareness and consciousness. Wonderful, wonderful. David Furlong, thank you so much for being on Passion Harvest. Where can people find you? And, and your uh, details will be in the show notes as well. Okay. Well, I, I have a website. So uh, if, if you look at, uh, uh, generally, if you just Google David Furlong, um, healer or something of that nature, it should come through to me. But it's, uh, uh, th that's the easiest. And, uh, and to just to look at, look at those details. And the, the other uh, site which I work through is called the Spirit Release Forum. So if you look at that if there's people who have got specific in, uh, issues around spirit release and the, there are a number of practitioners uh, that uh, I've taught or have been taught that um, uh, people can begin to contact uh, and be able you know, get support for but it's it's a huge area so I mean we we sort of need really a lot more people to a lot, a lot more uh, Davids well yes <laughs> Yes. Um, well, uh, it's, it's individuals who've got a sort of perspective or awareness, you know, somewhat akin to, to, to what I'm expressing. And we're all unique, we're all individuals, so I'm not interested in cloning myself. Um, uh, but uh, to see how other people can take on board and, ex and work with these ideas, that's the key thing, isn't it? It's recognising something of who and what we are and what we can do to transform ourselves. Wonderful. Well, thank you for being such an incredible light on this earth and in this realm of consciousness. David Furlong, thank you so much for being on Passion Harvest. Thank you, Louisa. It's okay. been a delight to be able to share with you and uh, all of your listeners. It's been an honour and a delight. Thank you so much, yeah. David. Bye for now. Bye then. Bye. If you like this episode, please do subscribe for weekly passionate inspirational interviews.